Uh, thank you, John. And, and I have to say, you know, to get the Toroja Medal in Spain, no less, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, uh, is, is quite an honor. And it's, uh, and it's important. And it gives me, uh, say, a, a forum to talk about some things that I think are very important. Uh, a, a month ago, uh, we had a symposium in Chicago, which was very IAS-like. Uh, it was uh, sponsored by the SM Foundation and Illinois Institute of Technology. And it was about creating new architecture through research. I, and uh, many people from IAS uh, uh, attended. And I think it's a very, very important topic. I think you know, we need to create uh, new architecture that is uh, more substantive, that is, uh, that is uh, you know, more efficient, lower carbon. And I think one of the ways to do that, part of it is just inspiration. That's fine. But also research, I think, is a good way to do this. And, and the reason we did it at IIT, it was motivated by the, uh, these two people, Myron Goldsmith and, and Mies van der Rohe. And when, uh, when uh, Myron did his uh, thesis in 1953, uh, he did it under Mies and did it, did it on the scale in tall buildings. So later when uh, Myron, who was an architect and an engineer, he um, studied under Luigi Nervi uh, in Italy after, after he worked with, uh, uh, with Mies. He actually was the guy who introduced uh, Jörg Schleich to Fritz Leonhardt, which is an interesting story. Uh, uh, and uh, he uh, uh, and uh, uh, he actually came to work at SOM as a structural engineer in our San Francisco office, and then later flipped into architecture and eventually became an architectural design partner uh, at the firm. Now, SOM is a is a firm of architects and engineers in one in one firm, and. And that was kind of a ch Chicago tradition. All the uh, Chicago firms back from the, uh, from the first Chicago School of Architecture were integrated practices of architects and engineers. So it wasn't like a unique statement. It was the way uh, work, uh, jobs or companies were organized in Chicago when the firm was founded in 1936. And so uh, later when uh, Myron moved back to Chicago as an architect, he, uh, he uh, teamed up with Fazer Khan and the two of them worked together at the firm, but they also taught at IIT, and they did a whole series of master's theses. They did their research. They took Myron's thesis. They, they brought it forward uh, to come up with new ideas. And in the one, uh, the uh, master's thesis from 1964, on the left, uh, a lot of things were learned that maybe showed up in this building a few, you know, about five years later. And so, uh, so this tradition of, of research leading to new architecture, I think, is very, very powerful. Now this forum we had had a philosophy uh, and, and, and that uh, was based on, number one is architecture is constantly changing. Uh, we're in this world where fashion changes every year and people look something new. And so unfortunately, a lot of times the new architecture is just putting silly hats on buildings. And, and so that, you know, so can, can we avoid this, you know, this, this transition of putting silly hats on things? And you know, I believe, as a technical person, and from what I've seen, uh, the technology and structures are, are key aspects uh, of this evolution uh, in architecture. And new technology can lead to uh, new opportunities in, in, in architecture. And we have these imperatives that's been spoken about uh, several times today, which I will also speak about. Uh, you know, climate change and embodied carbon. This is a big deal, and, and it has to be uh, it must lead to a change in architecture. Uh, and I do believe that research can lead to new substantive architecture, uh, something uh, th that is new and different. And, and these ideas for new architecture can come from many sources, you know, sustainability, the workplace, the, the, you know, why do we build these buildings? It's for the occupants, and, and, and can, we, can we make uh, better spaces for them? Um, uh, you know, the materials that we have and are, and may, are evolving. How we make these things, this whole uh, thing upstairs, uh, that uh, about you know, all these different pavilions that are made using uh, different techniques. Uh, the urban context is very, very important. Uh, you know, IAS maybe isn't as focused on that, but that's huge. Uh, construction, etc. Uh, you know, and and, uh, and and you know, the action is we have to see we have to actively uh, look for new ideas and knowledge. And, and and who needs to be involved? Well, architects and engineers for sure. Uh, academics for sure, but also urban planners, developers, artists, uh, physical scientists, social scientists, mathematicians, programmers, people who don't fit within the tradition of the building trades, uh, you know, uh, are, are these, these, these professions. I think it's very, very important that, uh, that they be, be engaged. But speaking to the group here in, in, the, in the room, 
Uh, we really uh, need to have a, a strong dialogue between architects and engineers. And, and I totally love this photograph. And we should almost call it the IAS um, uh, you know, logo. Here you have uh, the guy who's back to you, who, who's reaching out his arm, is Heinz Easter. And obviously, they're talking about the, the Munich Olympic stuff. Heinz Easter, you have Fritz Auer, Fry Otto, Jörg Schleich, Fritz Leonhardt, Rudolf Bergerman, and uh, Knut uh, Gabriel. And I want to know who took the photo. OK? <laughs> Uh, you know, and so you know, architects, engineers, academics uh, are working together to, to create a new architecture that it was, that was new and different and substantive. It was different for a reason. Now, at, at SOM, our approach in the last few years, in our approach, always constantly changing. So you, I'm just giving you a snapshot. We have two groups at SOM. We call one is called the Research Gang, because uh, and I'll tell you, and another group is called the Black Box. And, and, and these are names, self-named groups. Uh, uh, and so, uh, and both of these groups are, are totally volunteer. It, it doesn't really affect your professional career in the firm. It's people who want to do it, who want to take the time and work on new stuff. And, and they do it, you know, we meet at lunch showers and stuff like that. We I generally have either, uh, for the active groups, or some active groups are not so active, uh, you know, we meet either uh, once a week or, or, or every other week or maybe once a month. Uh, and um, the, uh, the research gang is uh, primarily engineers with some architects uh, belonging to it, but its fo focus is fundamentally on uh, fundamental knowledge and primarily of structural nature. Uh, there's also, we have a sustainable engineering group in the, in the firm, and so they're also doing, uh, doing some stuff. Now, uh, we can create ideas, but now you've got to get it into the architecture. And so the black box group, which is an ironic name, okay, uh, it's about not being a black box at all. Uh, this is a computational design group uh, of architects uh, with some engineers. And there's, of course, people who belong to both groups, uh, and they get together. And a lot of times these people are, uh-oh, what did I do? Okay, okay, we're back. Uh, the, uh, they're um, uh, fairly young in their career. Because uh, when you get more senior, you get busy, you got too many projects, too many deadlines, you kind of like wander off of the, the group. And, and we call it a research gang because it's not a group, or it's not organized, okay? It's just kind of a gang, a, a bunch of people. And you know, we're from Chicago, you know, we're, we're the gangsters, you know, okay? Uh, you, you know, so you, you, you know, have the, the, these uh, gangs of people, uh, uh, similar focus. But the Black Box group is very important. Um, they're primarily architects with some engineers. Uh, and they're focused on the architectural aspects of digital design. And they're also uh, tasked with integrating all the disciplines uh, into design, not just structures, but the mechanical systems, you know, the uh, lighting and, you know, uh, all, all of these things, you know, urban planning. Uh, how do you bring it all together? And so uh, they're, they're groups where I think you need both of. And, and, and what I'm giving you is not a roadmap that I suggest other people follow. But I'm just saying what we did, I kind of suggest other people should think about how you want to do it, and you should be doing it. And, and so, uh, we, so there is, um, um, these groups are, uh, are symbiotic, they, they support each other, but they're different. And so the research gang uh, does some things, and then the black box does other things, and there's overlap of, of things that, that they're, they're both interested in. Now, uh, here, here's, here is, this is a, this is a big lift. Getting a, from, from an idea to reality, okay, this is tough. Uh, first of all, you have to have an idea, okay? So that's what the research gang does, it creates ideas. And then you got to figure out, okay, we got an idea, now how are you going to get it so it can be actually used in, in, in design of a building or something? And so you, usually it means you have to create tools that are used in design. Now these tools are homegrown, they're full of bugs, they crash all the time. So to find designers who are willing to invest time and effort and patience uh, to, to, to get these tools uh, in use on, on project. Then you gotta find the project that, you know, that will do. Now, fortunately, we do a lot of work in China, so we have lots of competitions, we do. And so uh, a lot of times we'll do th maybe five different ideas and maybe, uh, and, you, and you test out different ideas in each of the schemes, then you compete it together, and eventually you end up with one scheme which may have components of the, of the five ideas that you started with. And then you gotta get the building built. And that can take years. And so, it, you know, it is not easy, but you just have to keep pushing. 
uh, and um, it, you know, and the uh, the inspiration for the research gang uh, was actually from an artist, okay, Jamie Carpenter, who spoke at the uh, Boston IASS. Uh, Jamie is an artist who works in glass and he has very good uh, structural sense. A lot of his stuff is very structural art. And I remember going to his, his office, and he had about 10 people. And I swear he knew more about glass technology than SOM with 1,000 people. And I thought, how is this possible? And I, it was, and I came to the conclusion it was because he was trying. You don't need a lot of people. You just need a few people who care. And are, are, willing, to, are willing to, you know, spend some nights and weekends reading some papers and, you know, fooling around and waking up in the middle of the night with an idea and writing it down. Another artist we're working with quite a bit now is uh, Janet Eckelman. This is her studio. And that's about her whole crew. And, and, and so she's doing all this research. Talk about lightweight structures, okay? Uh, so she's doing all this research on how do nets, nets hang and stuff like that. Uh, she's fortunate to, to uh, marry a man who's like a, kind of a genius, who uh, uh, used to be a computer science guy and, and um, you know, he also has a Harvard MBA, so he's able to keep her, you know, uh, you know financially sound. And what I love about uh, artists is that they're, they're, an artist is a design-build contractor, okay? They come up with the design, they have to research it, they got to figure out how to do it, they got to then build it and install it. I mean, you know, they do the whole thing. And unlike us, where our insurance guys won't let us get out there with a hammer and, and, and do things, that, you know, these, it's a, it's, you know, we do a building, they do an installation. And, and, and this installation, they can get their hands dirty and they really, they really get some, some pretty deep, deep understanding. And so uh, you know, the motivation of the research gang is similar to that, that conference I told you about from a month ago. Uh, and, um, and so our, our motivation uh, is very similar. Uh, can we create new design space? Can we create new technologies like Fry Auto and, and all the Schleich people and all the, all the, all the Stuttgart gang did? Uh, can, they, can, they create, uh, you know, new can we create new technologies that lead to new architecture? And I think that's very much what IASS is about. What I love about IASS, and from people here the first time, is um, this place is about ideas. You'll see a project here and there, but it's not about the project. It's about the idea behind the project. And this is a very sharing group. Everyone's, you know, sharing their ideas. It's not like a lot of academics things where someone has an idea, they, they write it down, they hide it until they publish it. And, and you know, this is about, you know, putting it all out there uh, for others. And, um, you know, very much uh, uh, responsible, sustainable design. Uh, part of the SOM ethos is uh, we, we believe in three things in our practice. We, we hope our architecture has one of three things. One is uh, uh, simplicity. Uh, number two is, is uh, sustainability, and number three is structural clarity. So a lot of our research is related to creating systems which have, have structural clarity. Um, also, you know, uh, you can take an existing technology and as it evolves, you, your aesthetics will change. And, and, and one of the problems we, we've had, you know, in the past, it's getting better, uh, Caramba helps and things like that, uh, is um, graphic tools are often getting run over, running over good structures. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure you get the analogy. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and, and so, you know, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, that in the, well, let me talk about it now. Um, uh, you know, well, when that, all this stuff first came out, you know, uh, architects would draw these sexy shapes that looked like eye candy, okay, had no basis in physics, but the engineers have tools that are so powerful, they can make it not fall over. That's, that's not our goal, okay? And so, you know, how can we tame the beast? <laughs> okay? I, and, 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 and I think we need to get, move beyond post-rationalization. You know, we've all done it. I've done it. Okay, we do something we really probably shouldn't have ever done, and we make a good backstory. Okay? As, you know, and, and engineers love to solve difficult problems, but maybe they should change the problem. Uh, and rather than, than just solve it. And what is amazing to me about the, the, the black box group and the research gang is all these people have a day job. They're working on jobs all the time. That's what they do in the daytime. They're working on projects. So I'm totally amazed how uh, uh, a lot of our research is just totally blue sky, no known applications. It's things we just find interesting uh, end up in projects. 
Uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, when you look at Janet Eckelman's art here in the lower right, uh, it's beautiful art, it's beautiful structure, it's beautiful equilibrium. And so uh, you see next to it is the graphic statics of the net. Uh, uh, one diagram is, is, is those horizontal nets that are, that are holding up uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the structural nets that are holding up the, art, the artist's nets, and below it is the force diagram. And, and so uh, how can, can you uh, visualize this stuff? Uh, here's something that uh, Toby, who's, who's here today, Toby Mitchell did, where uh, 3D graphic statics, well, where, where you're designing a bridge where all the members are very complicated. It's, it's a pedestrian bridge. It's at ramps. It curves. It's held up by an arch. And all the members are in pure compression under dead load by designing the forces. And I'll talk a bit about that. Now, uh, we're not always trying to get the best, best answer. You know, a lot of, time, uh, a lot of architects think that there's, there's one right answer when you do optimization. Uh, there's not. It's a family, OK? And maybe you don't want the highest peak because there's other things which you can't measure that, are, that you know are more valuable. And so maybe your, your sweet spot is, is maybe not quite on the peak. Well, where, where you take your design, but at least you know you're not down the valley at the bottom of the hill, okay? Uh, so now, uh, the research gang has had a very heavy focus on, on geometry, okay? And, you know, geometry, uh, you know, in the world of architecture is, you know, geometry is the intersection of architecture and structure. Uh, here, here's a building we did in London uh, a while back, and uh, if you describe this if, in architectural terms, and then you described it in structural terms, you would use the same words. You know, uh, the architect, there, there's, the, the building has such integrity that you cannot separate them, that, that they are one, okay? And I think that's very important. So geometry you know, is very important to architecture. It's huge for sustainability, absolutely huge. Here are two trusses that do exactly the same job. And if you're deflection controlled, the truss on the top has 60% uh, more material than the one on the bottom for the same deflection. Not 6%, 60%. That is huge. Um, uh, you know, and research can lead to new geometries, which will lead to new aesthetics. Uh, when we found this truss on the top, which for deflection, if you, um, if you look at the bottom, there's two equations, uh, V over V naught. Uh, the one on the, uh, on the top is within 5% of the absolute minimum you could ever get. And one of the things I like about you know, the earlier speech where you, you did some benchmarking to see you know, where's, where's the balance so you know how close you are. It's very important to benchmark, and Mitchell trusses are good for that. And so, uh, you know, so that's within 5% of the best you can do. And it had like thousands of members, so you, it's not really real, realistic. Uh, uh, but the Pratt truss below, which we, I used to use a lot and now almost never use, the same deflection needs about 60% more material. But people are uncomfortable with the top diagram because they haven't seen it. And I think, it's a, I think aesthetics is learned. As you get more exposed, you get more comfortable with it. And so I think well, we shouldn't uh, uh, shy away from something that you see that you haven't seen before. Now, uh, we were talking in, in, the, in, the, in the research gang, and we were using the words, and we were miscommunication, because uh, what, what the one word meant to somebody meant something else to the other. So this is a little um, uh, like a dictionary of what we mean. We have something called the design domain, uh, where you can do things. And then we use these three terms, which may not be correct mathematically or whatever, but this is what we use. Topology, uh, for us, is what is connected to what. OK, how many members do you have? How are they connected? Shape is how do you take that connectivity and move it about? And then finally, size. What is the size of the members? And, and, and you say the connections. Now, size is absolutely uh, essential, but otherwise unimportant. To, uh, uh, because I don't care. Uh, that's, that's a paraphrase for Hardy Cross, for those guys who don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, because. Most engineers spend their life in the bottom chart figuring out the size of the member and the, and the strength of the connection. But if, if you go back a few slides, I, that you'll, never find, you'll never get that 60% savings uh, in the structure just by making the connection better. 
So uh, as an engineer, you got to learn how to do the sizing, but uh, you need to move up the, up the ladder here into what I think you would call architecture. And so, you know, the, the, this uh, topology and shape is absolutely important. Now, the other thing that we've done in the research gang, we've taken a very visual approach because <coughs> we work with a bunch of architects and engineers who aren't the world's greatest mathematicians, okay? Uh, you know, there's, you know, we have some pretty good mathematicians, don't get me wrong, but <coughs> there's, uh, there's a few and far between. Uh, anyway, so, uh, and so I'm going to go back to, the, uh, to 50, uh, 1858, I think, or 1857, from a textbook by uh, Rankin, okay? This is, a, this is his textbook. Uh, so here you have a series of loads, and if, in the 19th century, if you wanted to, uh, to come up with a, a, a structure for that, what would you do? Well, you'd make a little force polygon of the applied loads and reactions. You put a dot on a piece of paper, you get out your straight edge, and you connect them, and then you'd lay out your structure. Graphically, you've done no calculations. You know how to design it now. You, you have in inspiration. And guess what? It works. Okay, you don't like that structure? Move the dot. Okay, you know how to solve the problem. Uh, you, uh, uh, you, want, uh, you don't want a, a hanging structure, you, you want an arch. Put the dot on the other side. Yeah, and, and looking at the work that uh, uh, Corinton and others and Dennis did, you know, up in, um, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, if, if IASS was around when he was practicing my R, he would have been a member, I, I assure you. Okay, and if, if you look at, uh, he, he calculated, he, one of the most beautiful bridges in the world, it was designed graphically. And you know that chart I just showed you? Look at that lower diagram. Off to the right, you can see the dot. Do you see the dot and, and, and the rays? He, uh, uh, he designed it graphically. And, 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 and you gotta, uh, you know, if you're doing this by hand, you know, I love the computers, okay, but if you do it by hand, you know, the feedback from your hand through your head back to the paper is, is incredible, and you can, you can see how he, he must have had inspiration as, as he did it. Now I'm gonna use an example, since we're at uh, IASS, uh, you know, shells and spatial structures. Let's talk about a shell. You know, let's look, a, a look to the past. Now, if you go back, I guess it's now uh, almost six, uh, 70 years? Yeah, almost 70 years, okay, to this. If you, want, if you uh, wanted to design a shell, you would have to go to a limited number of, of engineers in the world, probably not more than a handful, who knew enough to do it, okay? And, and so um, you know, here is Felix Candela paper from 1960, which is a good read, download it. Uh, you know, this is a, a, from the ACI journal. Uh, so here are his equations for designing hyperbolic paraboloid shell. And okay, let me do a more recent example and so, you know, we've moved beyond that to this, what I talked about earlier, where uh, somebody makes eye candy and an engineer uses a very powerful computer and it doesn't fall over. Uh, so uh, let's go to an elegant uh, example from the recent past, uh, the British Museum, the Great Court Roof, which was done by, not by us, by Foster's office, uh, by Burl Hoppel as the engineers, uh, uh, Wagner Burl as the, uh, as the contractor, and, uh, and Chris Williams as uh, uh, giving, doing a lot of the mathematics. Now, for me, this is a, an important structure, but it's also an important metaphor. Uh, you know, how do we make this accessible to normal designers, okay? Because, you know, um, uh, Chris uh, wrote these equations, and he gave these equations with certain variables to the design team in order to create um, the, the geometry of the roof. That's pretty wild, right? Okay, so that brings me to the basic question. How can we get beyond one of our greatest limitations? There is only one Chris Williams. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, th th now, in this room, there's some pretty, a lot of people are almost Chris Williams. No, I'll give you a <laughs> Okay, anyway. Um, but uh, so, so, so uh, here's an approach that we've been doing lately, which is trying to use graphic statics and the area stress function as a visual way to design uh, 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 structures, okay? And uh, we're going to go back to Maxwell, okay, 1864. Everybody in this room needs to read that paper and you will not understand it. Uh, a, a bunch of us are trying to 
translated into modern English, uh, uh, Corinthian, uh, John Oxendorf, uh, Philippe, uh, uh, Ella McRoby, uh, Marina. Uh, uh, we're all working on this thing right now. But uh, here is something that, that Maxwell observed in 1864 that we forgot. Hence, uh, and, and this is graphic statics. OK, you got two diagrams, load and uh, form and force diagram. Hence, the con conditions of the possibility of reciprocity in plane figures are the same as those of each figure being the perspective projection of a plane-sided polyhedron. Of course. <laughs> he doesn't prove it. He just observes it. OK? So and, and here's a diagram from uh, his, uh, his paper. You can see uh, I, I colored in those two triangles. And what they, what they like, the outside is like a compression ring, and the inside is a tension ring. You see those little uh, struts going in between. And you can see these lines, and, and, and he, was, he was basing that on the fact that uh, two, two planes intersect in a line, three planes intersect in a point, and this dashed line over here, is that coming up? Uh, it's not. Anyway, the, the dashed line there is where the planes are intersecting. He's doing a projection of, of, of a plane face polyhedron. Okay, and here, uh, uh, here is a plane face polyhedron. Any possible 2D projection of that is a self-stressful structure that can be pre-stressed. Totally amazing. And let's see if I can get this thing to stop. Okay. And so the, the, there, uh, there, there it is. Now, uh, Sergio, do you recognize the picture on the far right? That is from his PhD thesis, what he did under Caladine. So what we did is we took, we took this diagram from his PhD thesis and backed into a polyhedron that would match it. And, 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 and so that, there you have it. Uh, uh, here's another form and force diagram. And so uh, at, the, at the top is the force diagram. At the bottom is the form diagram. It looks like a cable net. Uh, and, if you, and if you project up the cable net, you can come up with a plain face polyhedron. Every face is exactly flat because it's an equilibrium. Every horizontal uh, spider web, all those quads and hexagons and pentagons, they are all the projections of a plane face polyhedron. OK? So here's a couple of spider webs, the force and form diagram. Both of those are projections of, of, of plane face uh, polyhedron. So uh, let's go to a more typical example of graphic statics. Uh, so, so here you have a truss, kind of a conventional uh, Pratt truss, the kind I don't do anymore. Uh, and, and you have, have the, the loads applied. And off to the right, you have the, the, the force diagram. And, and you see that. And so, well, what's a, and, and Maxwell did all of his, his uh, writing about self-stressed structures, or most all of his writing about self-stressed structures. And so uh, how, do you, how does this relate to a self-stressed structure? Well, let's put Rankin's dot onto the diagram and draw the, uh, the, the funicular. And then let's run that up. We have now created a self-stressed structure that has the, the structure has the same forces as the, as the earlier external loads. And guess what? It's a projection of a plane face polyhedron. And, and it turns out all the ridges are compression members, all the valleys are tension members, and the change in slope across the line is proportional to the force in the member. All right? And so there it is. Uh, you can separate the load part for, from the structure part. And, uh, and we'll spin it around here so, so you, you get a feel for it. There's also a, poly, a, po a face on the bottom. It's a closed polyhedron. Uh, and, and also sometimes you, uh, you'll have uh, intersecting polyhedrons also. And, and, and there you have it. Now, it, it turns out that the... Uh, uh, the, uh, this polyhedron has a reciprocal polyhedron, uh, uh, which, which uh, Maxwell uh, did as a, uh, as a polar projection of a uh, paraboloid of revolution. And we were going like, what the heck is that? Okay. Uh, you know, because we've lost the knowledge that Mac people in Maxwell's age does. We were talking about we've forgotten how to do, uh, uh, you know, where should you go? Uh, 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 we've, we've forgotten how, how to do ancient masonry. You know, we, we, we fill the, the drains with concrete. Well, we've forgotten a lot of just pure engineering. And, and that's what we're trying. And so uh, here is the reciprocal polyhedron, which projects down to the forces. 
Okay. Now, uh, and, and there's the load. So now, this particularly polyhedron has only one possible geometry to be in equilibrium. Uh, for the purely axial member, if, if it's a little different, you'd have moments. And so by picking, if you, if you, if you give the z coordinate, now you look into the plan, you see the x, y coordinates of all the points. And now for the area stress function, uh, by the way, this three-dimensional polyhedron is the area stress function. Forgot to say that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so to, to define the area stress function, you have to assign a z coordinate. So you pick uh, uh, three nodes, and, and then you've, uh, you define uh, the face F, that's now a plane. You pick one more, and every other node is known. Okay? So this structure only has one state of cell stress. This will, will apply later. I'm actually getting back to the British Museum, in case you wonder. Okay, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, um, anyway, so uh, here's another um, uh, spider web, if you will, that has two states of cell stress. It takes, uh, in order to completely define the geometry, you have to pick five nodes. Which means, and you look at the bottom, are the two families of states of cell stress that are possible uh, by this area stress function. Okay, let's go back to, first let's go back to Felix Candela, and here is, uh, here is the, area, here is the uh, structure, the projection of the structure. Here's the area stress function. Here are the, uh, uh, the uh, force diagram for the Candela shell, and, uh, and these are sub-pieces of both the uh, force diagram, form diagram, and the reciprocal polyhedras. And so let's see if I can get this thing to run. All right. Bingo. Yeah, yeah, you, you can lay it out and, and actually d design it. And, and, and you can actually read the forces. So the, here are the forces in the uh, force diagram and the uh, form diagram for the, uh, for the Candela shell. You, you can see the forces in the edge of the shell are the length of the lines coming off this radial point. Um, um, uh, the loads and the nodes, and so uh, the reactions at, at the edge of the uh, structure are these bounding uh, hexagon of the of the forces, and and the forces in the in the groins are the, that's where the tension is. And if you look at the area stress function, let me go back a couple slides. If you look at it, you can see by eye that this is in compression, because uh, remember when you had that one lecture on the area stress function in college that the second derivative of it is in this direction, is the stresses in that direction, okay? And so, uh, uh, because it's a plane place, you, you have a, a kink is the same as... as. And so, um, so, if the curvature is of one sign, in this case like that, everything that has that curvature is in compression. Everything that has the opposite curvature is in tension. And so you can see, by just looking at it, that these groins are in tension. Just by observing, this is, the, the, uh, this is like looking at forces in three dimensions. Uh, so so uh, th there are the forces uh, in the groins. And so uh, there's actually five geometric objects you can deal with. So you've got five ways to look at this information. At the bottom, you have the, the, uh, uh, the, the traditional for, uh, graphic statics form and force diagrams. Because graphic statics is just simplified area stress function. Uh, and, and then here you have the geometry of the structure, and here you have the geometry of the area stress function. Both the area stress function and the structure have the same uh, 2D projection. And then here's the reciprocal polyhedron that projects to the forces. Now, usually uh, graphic statics, we're just going back and forth between these two diagrams. Okay. Now, okay, so let's do a vi visual design of the Great Court Roof. Okay, uh, this, is a, this is a fourth year student project. We, I, we did this last uh, term uh, with a, with a uh, student, uh, uh, Tim Nugent, a student at Cambridge. Uh, uh, Alan Garelli was his uh, supervisor. Uh, uh, Mar Marina, I got your name there wrong, sorry, Marina uh, Constantato. Uh, and I were advisors on this, and so how can we design this visually? So, of course, we made a simplified model. So we have a, a, a circle inside a rectangle. Uh, you can see the grid that we assumed. We assumed a, a, like a, a smooth area stress, stress function to give us a guideline to go by. And so what we did is we took a, a, a smooth curve that, 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 that fit it. We, we gave it a haircut uh, for, the, for the oculus. And so 
We only have 15 in the, now, I, remember that, uh, for that truss I showed you, there's only one Z coordinate, you, you know, the one possible state of cell stress, that other one had two. This one has 15 possible area stress, families of area stress functions. So you have to pay with the Z coordinates of this, and we use that surface to give us an idea as to where to put it. And so here's the area stress function that gave us uh, forces. This is the, uh, in the 2D plane. Now what's interesting, uh, in graphic statics, in three-dimensional graphic statics, you, uh, any structure that's in equilibrium is in equilibrium no matter how you look at it. Any projection of it is still in equilibrium. And so, uh, the, uh, and so if you look straight down on it, you don't see gravity. Okay? So in this diagram, you do not see gravity, but you just see the reactions that are created because it, gravity exists in the three-dimensional case. And so uh, all the red members are in tension, all the blue members are in compression, and, and this is a self-stressed structure. Uh, then, then you use uh, uh, you know, uh, force density to put it in the three dimensions, and this is the shape we got. Oops, ah, that's okay. Well, it's actually an equilibrium. It's actually a valid shape. It's not, doesn't drain very well, okay? Uh, but, uh, so what you do, you then you, you evaluate the shape you had you evaluate the grid, you want to change it, you can look at your forces from the graphic statics and, and think about it, and then change the area stress function. And so here is the area stress function from the first guess, here's after it's been refined, here's the geometry, the equilibrium geometry we started with, here's where it ended up, and um, uh, not too bad. Did I miss a slide there? Um, okay, the... Um, Okay, and, and as pos part of this is we learn from mistakes. Our first area stress function looked like this, which from eyeball, you can tell. By the way, let me go back to this. Uh, th this area stress function tells you that you're primarily going to have compression going this way because of the curvature, okay? And you can tell because of the change in angle slope here, you're going to have tension at the edge, and you can tell by the change in slope here, you're going to have a compression ring. You can see that in the area stress function. You don't have to run any programs, computer programs, or find an element. Uh, and so, uh, so, yeah. so our first one, uh, uh, we left the oculus down. And so what it turns out, we had a tension ring here, but we also had a tension ring in the middle. Uh, and so, you know, we, oh, okay. So we had this grid, we looked at the forces, and in this, this equilibrium shape. And so uh, it was very interesting to learn from that that in retrospect, it was obvious to us we made a mistake, and we actually had tension. We were actually pulling up on the building in the middle. Uh, and, and so and we looked at the numbers, and it turns out, yeah, there was a compression. We had a tension ring in the middle. We had a tension ring at the edge, and we had a compression ring in the middle. So it was an equilibrium structure. And, um, and we actually could find a geometry where there would be no reaction on the center building. You could play with the area stress function until you had zero reaction on the center building. And so, so here it is. Pretty close for, it's not a bad fourth year student project, okay? Now, uh, but we, all we did was we got a, a, a structure that is equilibrium. What we need are, from the people in this room, visual tools that do embodied carbon, that tell us about buckling. Uh, where's uh, Eckerhard? Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, so a tool that tells us about buckling. Uh, deflections, you, you can kind of get that from here, but not quite. Do we need more curvature? You know, so we need more visual tools. All we've gotten to here is, is equilibrium. Uh, now, at SOM, we have a, we have a, a whole series of, uh, of design tools that we've made that com completely get broken every time the operating system changes. Uh, you know, so uh, we have, you know, uh, some commercial software. We have uh, uh, Altair that we use. Um, uh, we use a Polytop, which is a free download uh, uh, for two-dimensional um, force density. Uh, we use uh, uh, Top 3D, which is a three-dimensional um, density tool. Uh, but these are just uh, free downloads. Uh, a ground structure, which is also a free download. A, a graphic statics knowledge, which is just pure knowledge, okay? Uh, so, uh, surface optimization, grid optimization, tall building stuff. It's a whole other, another lecture. Seismic systems, uh, force density, which is a great, great, great uh, thing that was, uh, I guess, 1970s-ish from Stuttgart. Uh, we actually built our own wind tunnel because we do a lot of tall buildings. Uh, genetic algorithms, we, we, you know, you, you got your Galapagos 
uh, or other tools you, you can use. Uh, you, you know, we have the, the, the uh, ETH, uh, Zurich, uh, you know, gangs, uh, their gang, <laughs> they're more organized than we are. Uh, the, uh, um, you know, uh, tools. Uh, Mitchell Trust Knowledge, which is very huge. Uh, first time, I, everybody in this room should know what a Mitchell Trust is, all right? Uh, the early stress learning we talked about, machine learning, 3D printing, and, and then, of course, timber. And, 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 and so, you know, it is amazing, you know, you, you'll come up with ideas that you never expected. You may not build it, and you probably won't build it, but it'll, it'll tell you something you didn't know, and it'll also tell you how efficient you can be, okay? And, and then and they, these tools give you different information, you know, ground structure versus, uh, oops, sorry, uh, ground structure versus, um, uh, you know, a density method, you know, what do you do? Uh, you pick that, and you end up with something that's 60% better than the standard answer, okay? And, and, and we're showing, uh, and uh, we're putting this in buildings. This is a building that just opened in, in North Sydney, Australia. Uh, th there's the analysis, and, and we, we saw this high-waisted bracing, and we thought, what the heck is that? Is it real? Is it an art is it the artifact of the program we're using? And it turned out it was real. We actually proved it with virtual work. And so uh, you're going to see a series of buildings that are coming out that are, that are based on this. It's about turning the loads gently, uh, the lateral loads, loads down. This is kind of an interesting building because it's a steel bracing of a concrete building. So we had, had to deal with issues of creep and shrinkage and thermal. So uh, we let it breathe under symmetrical loads, but it resists anti-symmetrical loads. Um, uh, and, and if you look at it, and then we, we extended it. So here's what I call it N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3, N equals 5. And all this is about turning the loads gently. And we've proved to ourselves that, uh, that these are correct at the top, and we know that we're slightly wrong at the bottom. We haven't figured out how to fix that, but it's close enough. And, and so we're putting this uh, uh, in, into architecture. Uh, now, this building was in great shot, shape. We, we passed the expert panel review in China, and then our client went to jail. I always hate it when that happens. Uh, and it's not the first client, OK? Uh, the, anyway, so that job died. But yeah, we, we got some other stuff coming up in China. Uh, the, 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 that, that, is, that has that as part of the design. Uh, you, know, you know, you can use our gradient optimization. Uh, uh, you know, here's, uh, we're, we're trying to find the, the, the shape, uh, you know, of, um, of a tall building where the penalty function is uh, deflection and loading is wind. Uh, and, and, it tell, and, and, and you may not, you're not able to build it, but it tells you that uh, at the, if your base is constrained, you're trying, at the bottom you want it to be bigger because you want more moment inertia, more stiffness, and you don't care about the wind load. At the top, you're trying to dump wind load. And so a lot of this is, n it's not the answer, it's, it's why it's telling you this, and what is the information you're trying to take away from it. You know, going back to, you know, uh, forest density, incredible tool. Uh, surface optimization, you know, as we get into the sustainability issue, um, you know, uh, nature is very sustainably focused on, 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 on minimal structures. Uh, we're, we're here in the uh, wonderful town of uh, Barcelona, a world of Gaudi, just a uh, sh short flight uh, away from Stuttgart. And, and so uh, this is uh, uh, one of our engineers, uh, uh, Toby Mitchell, did this as his PhD thesis where he, he, he looked at um, what is the uh, three-dimensional, or show you the shell structure equivalent of a Mitchell truss, where you have same stresses in all direction. And you end up with these shapes which look very organic. I you know, call it the sushi, sushi tray of structures. Uh, you know, they, uh, all you do is play with the boundary condition and the inflation, and then the nature figures out the rest of it. Uh, you know, I guess it's Shishima, maybe, more than sushi. Uh, uh, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you grid things so that you have good grids? Uh, this is a project in, in New York City. This is uh, an earlier scheme where we had triangulated uh, uh, structure for the Moynihan train station this is right next to uh, uh, very near Penn Station. And it's part of the new Penn Station. And so we were able to convince everybody to go from triangles where all your joints are twisted to quads where you, where you have planar, uh, you know, you, can, you maybe get planar glass, but you can get with non-twisted joints for much uh, cleaner construction. And, and, and uh, here's one of Toby's trifectas. It, it is a, uh, it is, it is a, uh, a, a uh, optimal surface, all the panels are flash, flat, and none of the joints are twisted, okay? And uh, it can be done. Uh, we talked about graphic statics. Uh, here's another Maillard uh, roof, which has been, been around for oh, about 90 years. Uh, we, we did this uh, uh, based on an IASS. Uh, 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 Toby saw this paper by, uh, by Tashi uh, 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 and, uh, and, and actually read it. 
And, and so we end up doing, uh, 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 you know, three-dimensional graphic, this 3D graphic statics forming force diagram. So here you have a, a, a net that is in equilibrium, but it's a K-net, so, so all four bars going into one node are in a plane. And so it's dual is a, is a flat, is a quad that is flat. So uh, every node maps to a polygon. And so, so I, if your node has four members that are in one plane, you will have a flat panel, okay? And so, so uh, we, we, we took this on and we made this pavilion, which will be in London uh, in the spring. We, we've been moving it around the world. It was just in Mexico City. And, and we actually built this in our model shop at the office. And then we, we brought a space from one of our clients and we put it together. And so it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, one degree of freedom, rigid origami, if you will. And, and all those panels are exactly flat, okay? Um, you know, of course, uh, there's, there's the, uh, the, the block group toys uh, th that are out there, are form and force diagrams. And then they, they have this, uh, their new push is, you know, the compass, which is a, a open source. And there's a reason that we should be doing open source and sharing ideas. Uh, I'll get to that very quickly. I'm almost out of time. Uh, then, then you have um, a shape, you know, we do a lot of tall buildings, so we built our own wind tunnel. Uh, 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 Austin Devin, who's in the room, uh, he does a lot of our research in the wind tunnel. You can, uh, th uh, these are, talk about sustainability, these are tall buildings. Uh, this is, the square root of this is related to the forces on the structure. And these are the same, these are multiple buildings with the same volume of material. Look, if you have a bad shape, you've got huge forces. And so uh, we actually uh, design our buildings in the one tunnel. Uh, we're, of course, doing work in, uh, in, in timber. Uh, do, we're doing some testing at Oregon State. We're trying, to, we're trying to catch up with the Austrians, okay, you know, which is kind of hard to do. They're, they got a good start. Uh, anyway, um, the um, uh, 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 construction, you know, uh, 3D printing, of course. Uh, uh, last uh, summer, uh, we, we, we printed a barracks. Uh, um, for the, uh, at, at the uh, Army Research Center. And we've been uh, uh, playing around with some of the, these uh, uh, moon and, and, uh, and, um, and Martian uh, things. Uh, we've been doing a machine learning for inspection. Uh, this is a, a post-earthquake inspection using machine learning to, uh, to recognize structural damage, or you can use it for rebar inspection or a field inspection to see if what's being, being built is the same as what we did. Uh, can we teach it to come up with good shapes for tall buildings? And so, you know, so th this toolbox emerging, I urge everyone in this firm, everyone in this office, in your, in your firm, play, you know, do something fun. Uh, we need more research, we need more research funding, sorry. Uh, we need more participation, we just need more. And it's, uh, and not only do we at IASS like doing efficient structures, uh, we must do efficient structures. Or shall I say after today's speech, we need to do low carbon uh, structures, okay? And so, you know, this has been talked to uh, many times. A year ago, this month, the UN is issued this report. We've lost a year already, okay? About, uh, you know, uh, we, we have like this window of opportunity to 2030 to, 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 to change the trajectory, trajectory we are on. Uh, we have this huge population growth uh, in the time that Manfred and I have been practicing, there are twice as many people in the world than there were when we started our professions. Imagine every person, half the room, that part, well, I don't know, half the room was empty. That is the population we, we had when we started our practice. Whew. Okay, uh, you know, we're generating people at about a, a billion people every 12 years, which is 1.25 Barcelonas per month that we need to be building out there, which is a huge carbon problem. And, um, and the, but the population growth rate is actually dropping. You know, the populations are huge because we're, we're, we're on the slope. And, and, and where are the people? Guess what, they're not in Northern, and they're not in Europe. They're not really in North America. There's some in Latin America. Uh, uh, Asia, which is well represented here, okay? Because who, who has the expertise to minimize carbon? The IASS, okay? Uh, now, we, we don't have many members from Africa. And look at that huge population growth. That's a, can, can they, can they uh, skip uh, the technologies we have and go to the next generation? Just like India uh, skipped the wireless phase of uh, 
telephones, they went straight straight to uh, digital or to, to wireless. Uh, you know, th there's, you know, we've talked about roughly um, uh, three quarters of the, you know, the initial car uh, embodied carbon is in structure. There's a lot of move, uh, as we saw, in trying to bring embodied carbon up front. Now, but also associate this, you know, the world's not black and white. Uh, we still need dreams and aspirations. Is this going to be forbidden? I hope not. You know, uh, you know uh, one of the jokes we have, this is a very expensive way to make a restaurant. <laughs> uh, but, 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 you know, uh, but, you know, Paris and France would not be Paris or France or Europe without it. So how do we, you know, judge th these things? But the people of ISS have the knowledge and the skills. I don't know any other organization that has, has the bandwidth of this group to, uh, to do it, to, to make a difference. With that, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs>